And then this is um, shorter, I believe. <laughs> this is one of the poems that, a kind of poem that depends completely um, for any sense on its title. It's just four lines long. It's called Divorce. Divorce. Once, two spoons in bed. Now, tined forks across a granite table and the knives they have hired. <laughs> Ouch. Um, San Diego is such a beautiful place. Maybe you're immune to this stuff, but uh, probably not. And the poem I'm going to read is a sonnet, and it's about, um, it's kind of a reaction to the, um, you know, pro proliferation of gated communities and condo developments. And um, what strikes me about them, besides just the fact that they're there, is the names that they have are usually these very rustic names, <clears throat> like kind of Badger Meadow or, you know, uh, Deer Hollow and stuff like that. And these, yes. there's a sadness there because these are essentially, the, the names are essentially uh, epitaphs for the animals that have been displaced, uh, you know, run off in order to build the community. So I thought I'd um, respond to that. It's a sonnet called The Golden Years uh, because I picture the uh, speaker as a retired guy. The Golden Years. All I do these drawn out days is sit in my kitchen at Pheasant Ridge where there are no pheasants to be seen and last time I looked no ridge. I could drive over to Quail Falls and spend the day there playing bridge, but the lack of a falls and the absence of quail would only remind me of Pheasant Ridge. I know a widow at Fox Run and another with a condo at Smoky Ledge. One of them smokes and neither can run, so I'll stick to the pledge I made to Midge. Who frightened the fox and bulldozed the ledge? I ask in my kitchen at Pheasant Ridge. <laughs> oh, thank you. Here, um, I want to read two poems about dogs and uh, about people. Uh, the amazing. Uh, Dennis Wills has tried to freak me out by <laughs> scotch taping a picture of my dog <laughs> to this table. So, it's like, you know, as if I'm not nervous enough. You know, dog is looking at me. Here. But this is actually about, this is about her, and um, uh, it's called Dharma. Her name is Janine. Um, but um, it's, it, it has, the title has, is a spiritual word, rather undefinable, because I'm trying to figure out if the dog has that kind of a capacity. Dharma. The way the dog trots out the front door every morning without a hat or an umbrella, without any money or the keys to her doghouse, never fails to fill the saucer of my heart with milky admiration. Who provides a finer example of a life without encumbrance? Thoreau in his curtainless hut with a single plate, a single spoon? Gandhi with his staff and his wire spectacles? Off she goes into the material world with nothing but her brown coat and her modest blue collar, following only her wet nose, the twin portals of her steady breathing, followed only by the plume of her tail. If only she did not shove the cat aside every morning and eat all his food. <laughs> what a model of self-containment she would be. What a paragon of earthly detachment. If only she were not so eager for a rub behind the ears, so acrobatic in her welcomes, if only I were not her god. <laughs> Thank you. So I, um, that's tricky. You know, you're right about that poem uh, gets a little moist. 
there. You know, but it's tricky. You write, you know, write poems about um, house pets, and uh, but I you know, just have this, you know, love for dogs. So that often a dog will just wander into a poem or write a poem about a dog. But hard to make them stick, you know. And uh, I have a um, I, so I set out really with an ambition, and that was to um, to write a poem about a dog that was not sentimental. Well, here's a short one that probably is before I read the other one, so you're the three dog night here. Um, this is uh, uh, 12 lines. It's, it's, it's spoken by a dog, uh, or you could say written by the dog, um, and it's called um, A Dog on His Master. And the dog speaks, A Dog on His Master. As young as I look, I am growing older, faster than he. Seven to one is the ratio they like to say. Whatever the number, I will pass him one day and take the lead the way I do on our walks in the woods. And if this ever manages to cross his mind, it would be the sweetest shadow I have ever cast on snow or grass. <laughs> So then I tried to write a sort of hard-hearted <laughs> poem, you know, about a dog, and it's called The Revenant, and it's, uh, it's about a, a dog, uh, a revenant is a ghost, right, through, that visits you. The Revenant. I am the dog you put to sleep, as you like to call the needle of oblivion. Come back to tell you this simple thing. I never liked you. <laughs> when I licked your face, I thought of biting off your nose. When I watched you toweling yourself dry, I wanted to leap and unman you with a snap. I resented the way you moved, your lack of animal grace, the way you would sit in a chair to eat, a napkin on your lap, a knife in your hand. I would have run away, but I was too weak a trick you taught me while I was learning to sit and heal and, greatest of insults, shake hands without a hand. <laughs> I admit the sight of the leash would excite me, but only because it meant I was about to smell things you had never touched. <laughs> you do not want to believe this, but I have no reason to lie. I hated the car hated the rubber toys, disliked your friends, and worse, your relatives. The jingling of my tags drove me mad. You always scratched me in the wrong place. All I ever wanted from you was food and fresh water in my metal balls. While you slept, I watched you breathe as the moon rose in the sky. It took all of my strength not to raise my head and howl. Now, I am free of the collar, free of the yellow raincoat, monogram sweater, the absurdity of your lawn. And that is all you need to know about this place, except what you already supposed, and are glad it did not happen sooner, that everyone here can read and write, the dogs in poetry, the cats, and all the others in prose. <laughs> revenge there. Um, 